Imagine a world in which one of the things owned by a corporation was the song Happy Birthday. In fact, an AOL Time Warner subsidiary holds the copyright. In the past, it has demanded over $10,000 to allow you to hear anyone sing this popular song in a film. We didn't pay. We preferred to use the money to fly our crew to Boston and Los Angeles to bring you the following story. Five, four, three, two, one. Off into space. Man, that takes real teamwork. And here's a team of junior spacemen with an out-of-this-world breakfast. Comparing the marketing of yesteryear to the marketing of today is like comparing a BB gun to a smart bomb. It's not the same as when... I was a kid, or even when the people who are young adults today were kids. It's much more sophisticated and it's much more pervasive. It's not that products themselves are bad or good. It's the notion of manipulating children into buying the products. In 1998, Western International Media, Century City, and Lieberman Research Worldwide conducted a study on nagging. We asked parents to keep a diary for three weeks and to record every time, you could imagine, every time their child nagged them for a product. We asked them to record when, where, and why. This study was not to help parents cope with nagging. It was to help corporations help children nag for their products more effectively. Anywhere from 20% to 40% of purchases would not have occurred unless the child had nagged their parents. That is, we found, for example, a quarter of all visits to theme parks wouldn't have occurred unless a child nagged their parents. Four out of 10 visits to places like Chuck E. Cheese would not have occurred. And any parent would understand that. You know, when I think of Chuck E. Cheese, oh my goodness, it's noise. And there's so many kids. Why would I want to spend two hours there? But if the child nags enough, you're going to go. We saw the same thing with movies, with home video, with fast food. We do have to break through this barrier where, the, where they do tell us, or they say, they don't like it when their kids nag. Well, that's just a general attitude that they possess. It doesn't mean that they necessarily act on product 100% of the time. You can manipulate consumers into wanting and therefore buying your products. It, it's a game. Children are not little adults. Their minds aren't developed. And what's happening is that marketers are playing to their developmental vulnerabilities. The advertising that children are exposed to today is honed by psychologists. It's enhanced by media technology that nobody ever thought was possible. The more insight you have about the consumer, the more creative you'll be in your communication strategies. So if that takes a psychologist, yeah, we want one of those on staff. I'm not saying that it's wrong to make things for children. You know, and I also think it's important to distinguish between psychologists who work on products for children, who help, help you know, toy cor corporations make toys that are developmentally appropriate. I think that's great. That's different from selling the toys directly to the children. The initiative is huge. I think in the U.S. we place about $12 billion of media time. So we'll put it on TV, we'll put it in print, we'll put it out in outdoor, we'll, we'll buy radio time. So we're the biggest buyers of advertising time and space in the U.S. and in the world. One family cannot combat an industry that spends $12 billion a year trying to get their children. They can't do it. They are tomorrow's adult consumers, so start talking with them now, build that relationship when they're younger, and you've got them as an adult. Somebody asked me, Lucy, is that ethical? You're essentially manipulating these children. 
Well, yeah, is it ethical? I don't know. But our, our role at initiative is to move products. And if we know you move products with a certain creative execution, placed in a certain type of media vehicle, then we've done our job. Every institution provides the people who are members of it with a social role to occupy. And typically, institutions that are vibrant and, and have a lot of power will specify that role in, in some sense as, as a list of virtues. It's true for churches, for schools, for, for any institution that, that has power over, over people and, and shapes them. One nation. The corporation, likewise, it provides us with a list of virtues, a kind of social role, which is the good consumer. Like the waters of a mighty ocean, people also represent a tremendous force, the understanding of which is of greatest importance to the American way of life. This force is known as consumer power. The goal for the corporations is to maximize profit and market share, and they also have a goal for their target, namely the population. Now they have to be turned into completely mindless consumers of goods that they do not want. Uh, you have to uh, develop what are called created wants. So you have to create wants. Uh, you have to impose on people what's called a philosophy of futility. Uh, you have to focus them on uh, the insignificant things of life, like fashionable consumption. I'm just basically quoting business literature, and it makes perfect sense. So the ideal is to have individuals who are totally dissociated from one another, whose conception of themselves, uh, the, the sense of value, is just how many created wants can I satisfy? These people are customers because they are willing to trade money for widgets. And all the customers take their widgets home to all parts of the country. Look at all that money the widget builder has taken in from the sale of his widgets. We have huge industries. Public relations industry is a monstrous industry. Advertising and so on is, uh, which are designed from infancy to try to mold people into this desired pattern. We saw Tiger Woods on TV with a hat with a Nike logo on it, and we figured, you know, he probably gets, like, millions of dollars just to wear the hat on the press conference, and therefore we figured we can do that for someone else and hopefully get money in turn so we can go to school. And that's how we came up with being corporately sponsored. We made our sponsor announcement on today's show on June 18th. We're thrilled to be sponsored by First USA. We're thrilled to be working with First USA as our corporate sponsor, and they're covering our college tuition to found First USA as our sponsor, and we're proud to be working with them. Our so sponsor is First USA, so we are really thrilled to announce uh, First USA as our sponsor. We're thrilled to be working with First USA. And so we give First USA a good name in the media and include them in our news stories, and then through there they get as much advertising as we can give them. They'll be conforming not to the wishes of demanding parents, but to the wishes of an image-conscious corporation. They're not just out there for the money, and they're just, I mean, they want to work with us and be our friends and, and let us help them help us and vice versa. Uh, we became walking billboards to pay for our college tuition. Cool Site of the Day picked us as Cool Site, and Yahoo picked us, and we were in USA Today. When we did our photo shoot for People Magazine, this is where we stood. <laughs> Up on top. <laughs> we stood up here and we smiled. We smiled and took the picture. Our parents had war stories and stuff to tell us, but <laughs> we have our corporate sponsor story. Exactly. I mean, I have a lot of faith in the corporate world because it's always going to be there, so you may as well have faith in it because if you don't, then that's just not good. Canada's most popular documentary. The Corporation, now on DVD. More than eight hours of extras on two discs, commentaries, the making of, deleted scenes, and more. 165 new interview clips on 23 topics with related web links and strategies for change. Special offers at thecorporation.com. Make us social change. World domination not included.